Foothills, how we doing? It's good. Hey, can we welcome those joining us online and our Pendleton campus? Hey, we're just warming up. I want you to do this. Shake your hands a little bit. Shake your hands. You know why? It's Baptism Sunday! That's right. We're going to celebrate a little bit later in the service. I can't wait. But first, we're going to have a conversation about doubt today. Because doubt is something that every single one of you, every single one of us, deals with in our life. I mean, think about every decision that you've had to make in your life. Isn't doubt a part of the equation? Doubt, doubt is that moment of pause or fear before you make a decision. It's the moment that causes you to, to second guess it, to maybe quit. And then after you've made the decision, wouldn't it be nice if doubt went away? But doesn't it seem like even after the decision, doubt is still there? Think back through the course of your life in different moments when you were trying to think, man, what school do I want to go to? Oh, and then you pick the school and you're saying, wait, did I pick the right school? Was it the right? And then what do I want? What do I want my major to be? And then did I pick the right major? Maybe I'll switch majors and then I'll switch majors again and I'll just switch again. I don't know. And then maybe you're trying to figure out who's the one? Is she the one? Is he the one? And then maybe when you got ready to purchase your first home, should I buy this house? Should I have bought this house after you buy the house? Or if you were looking for a job, should I take that job? Should I have taken that job? Should I move? Should I have moved? Or maybe there's a situation in your life where you're, you're analyzing whether or not you should do treatment. And you're thinking about it, saying, I don't know. I don't know if I should do this treatment. And you step forward, you're like, did I pick the right treatment? Doubt is just an inevitable part of being a human. As I was starting to write this message and thinking about it, I was thinking about some of the best decisions I've made in my life, and probably one of the best, if not the best, was choosing my bride, Katie, all right? And so I was just, I was feeling all romantic. I, I grabbed my phone, and I'm just, it's the middle of a work day, I'm like, hey, babe, I love you. And whenever I send a text like that, Katie goes, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, you know, I was just thinking about it, I was like, you know, I'm I, I just curious, when, when I proposed and when we were getting ready to get married, did you ever have any doubts that I was the one? This was her response, duh. <laughs> it's like, oh man. So then I thought, okay, well, well you know what, after we got married, one way I said, so then we got married and, and after, after we got married, you knew without a shadow of a doubt. She goes, no, I still doubted. I was like, this conversation is over. <laughs> this conversation is over. Listen. Doubt is an inevitable part of being a human. We doubt all kinds of things in our life, and doubt also exists in our faith in Jesus. Because again, we are human. And so if, if, you have, if you're in this room today and you are a follower of Jesus, whether you're new to following Jesus or whether you've been following him for a long time, if someone told you that you would have zero doubt in your faith, they lied. And if someone told you that Jesus would be disappointed if you had a little bit of doubt, they also lied about that. Because actually, we see in the scriptures that Jesus embraces people who have doubt and bring their questions to Jesus. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at one of the disciples named Thomas. He was one of those close to Jesus. And we're going to look at why he was given the nickname Doubting Thomas. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's go to John chapter 20. We're going to start at verse 24. Before we read this, let me set up the scene. On the night after Jesus rose from the dead... Most of the disciples were hiding in a room. And the reason they were hiding, we talked about this last week, but there was a theory that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body. And so they were afraid that the Jewish leaders were going to come and arrest them. They were afraid for their lives. So they're behind this locked door. And while they're there, Jesus appears to them. And, and when Jesus appeared, he showed them. He showed them the, the scars in his hand and, and on his side. And, and showed them the proof that, yes, he was dead, but now he's alive so that they can have hope and they can have faith that he is the Savior. And so as this scene ends, we're picking up in verse 24 where they run into Thomas, who wasn't there that night. If you're ready to read the word, would you just say, ready? ready. All right, here we go. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. 
they told him, we've seen the Lord. I mean, and can you imagine just like sometimes when we read scripture, we can glance, but imagine the emotion of telling Thomas, we've seen him. He is alive. We've seen Jesus. He's not in the tomb. I know we saw the crucifixion. I know it was crazy, but we, we saw the scars in his hands. We've seen the Lord, but he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Into the wound. Now, this is Thomas. This is one of Jesus' closest followers. He was on Jesus' starting lineup, the 12 disciples. He saw Jesus do incredible miracles and incredible teachings. Jesus had predicted that he was going to be killed and that three days later he would raise. Thomas has heard all of this, but in this moment, Thomas is saying, you know what? I've had enough of this. I've bought it too long. And in this moment, Thomas is paused and he's second guessing whether or not this is true. And he's saying, I won't believe it unless I see it. Why did someone so close to Jesus that had walked with him three years, got a front row seat to all of it, why would someone that close to Jesus experience doubt? And why would you and I experience doubt in our relationship with Jesus? Well, one of the reasons is this. Faith will make you feel crazy sometimes. Let me say that again. Faith will make you feel crazy sometimes. Jesus and his following had created a lot of noise before his crucifixion had happened. I mean, they drew crowds from all over. People wanted to hear Jesus' teaching. People wanted to see the signs and wonders, the miracles. But the craziest thing Jesus did is he claimed to be the son of God. And when he claimed this, this literally put a line in the sand with how people perceived him. Some people believed, but other people, that was like too far for them to step over and believe, especially those religious leaders who were worried that Jesus was threatening their traditions or way of doing things. They looked at this like, Jesus is crazy, and his followers are crazy. C.S. Lewis said in more words than this that basically Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or in fact the Lord. A liar, a lunatic, or in fact the, the Lord. And so people who looked at Jesus as being crazy also looked at his followers as being crazy. Thomas and these other disciples looked crazy for a long time. Now, thankfully, Thomas could look back through history before Jesus and see that anyone who put their faith in the God that Jesus was claiming to come from, the God that Jesus was claiming to be, they would see that crazy was a part of the faith journey all throughout the scriptures, all throughout Israel's history. You think about how crazy Noah looked building an ark in the desert when it had never rained before. Think about how crazy Sarah, Abraham's wife, looked at 90 years old buying maternity clothes. Think about how crazy the Israelites looked when they, when they took horns and trumpets and they were rallying to to march around the walls of Jericho seven days in a row. Think about how crazy that would have been. Think about how crazy it would have been for David as a young man to go up against Goliath and all he had was a slingshot and a few smooth stones. Think about how crazy it would have been for wise men from a distant land, from another place that are following some star because they heard that the savior of the world is, is coming over in Bethlehem. And so they start a journey. Think about how crazy that is. And then let's look at our savior, Jesus. Think about how crazy Jesus looked when he hung from that cross half naked, beaten and battered in front of the very people that he claimed to be the son of God to. Think about how crazy all of this must have felt like and must have been. See, as we look at all of this, when you start to look crazy to everyone else long enough, it's easy to maybe buy the, bet by the headlines and feel like maybe I, have, maybe I have gone crazy. 
We see this with someone else other than Thomas that was close to Jesus, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was, he was the messenger that came ahead of Jesus. He was actually Jesus' cousin. He came six months before Jesus. And, and the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit had literally anointed and filled John the Baptist while he was still in the womb. And he had a specific assignment to go and tell the world that they needed to repent of their sins because the Messiah was coming, the Savior was coming. And John the Baptist was the one who got to be there when Jesus came to get baptized. And John the Baptist at that scene tells everyone, this is the one. This is the Savior that we've been waiting for that has come to save us from our sins. John the Baptist knew exactly who Jesus was. But you know what happened later on? Later on, John the Baptist gets arrested because of his faith. And while he's in jail, there's a moment where John the Baptist starts to think, maybe I have gone crazy. And so we see a scene in Matthew where he sends some of his followers to go and question Jesus because he needs to know that he hasn't gone crazy. Look at this in Matthew 11. Matthew 11, 2 and 3 says, John the Baptist who was in prison. And again, this is after, this is after he has announced to everyone exactly who he believes that Jesus is. John the Baptist who was in prison heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? Are you the one? I mean, this is John the Baptist who, who knew he was the one. And here he is in prison in this moment, which, by the way, this would be the, the lead up to John the Baptist dying for his faith. He would be beheaded because of who he was and, and the message that he had come to bring. And while he's sitting there, he's just double checking. All right, I feel crazy. What if I got it wrong? Have I gone crazy? Could this be right? And so he sends out, and, and here's what I love. If you read this story, I'd encourage you to go read this, Matthew 11. Go read it later. Jesus responds in such an incredibly kind way. Jesus does not rebuke John the Baptist. Jesus speaks right to the question. Jesus actually points to old prophecies that John the Baptist would have known about that talk about, hey, here's the signs and wonders that, that people are seeing me accomplish, and this is what Isaiah talked about. You can have confidence that I'm the one. And then while Jesus had a captive audience who were curious how Jesus would respond to this, Jesus did not put John the Baptist down for having this question. This is actually where Jesus tells them there's never been anyone greater who lived than John the Baptist. Jesus actually meets this question to say, hey, when you bring your doubts to the table, when you bring your questions to the table, that is strong faith. Rather than giving up and walking the other direction. Look, faith will sometimes make you feel crazy. It will sometimes make you feel crazy, but I would even say this, if you don't feel a little bit crazy, then you're probably not walking in faith. Can I say that again? If you don't feel a little bit crazy, then you're probably not walking in faith. Now, here's another reason that, that we experience doubt, and a reason that faith will make us feel crazy, is this, faith involves unanswered questions. Faith involves unanswered questions. I, I shared this recently, but I love the Bible. It's filled with so much truth about who God is. It's filled with so much instruction about how we live our lives. But doesn't it seem at times when you're looking for specific answers in your faith, I'm not saying it's not here, but doesn't it seem that at times it gives vague answers instead of specific ones? Like you want it broken down real specific, but sometimes it requires that we have faith with things that we can't fully answer or explain. And actually, Thomas had experienced this in his relationship with Jesus far before Jesus' crucifixion. There was a time that Jesus was having a conversation with the disciples, and he talked about how there would be a day soon where he would go to his father's house in heaven, and he would be preparing rooms for them. And then when the time was right, he would come back and get them. And so this is, this is where I want to pick this up. This is in John 14, 4 through 6. It's on the screens. Jesus said, you know the way to the place where I am going. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas says, hold up. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Uh, 
So how can we know the way? We, we don't know where heaven is. We haven't found heaven. How can we find the way to where you're going? And look at Jesus' real specific answer. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is this is an answer that is true, that Jesus is the way. But Thomas, if, if you're anything like Thomas, Thomas isn't getting all the details that he would like. I think Thomas is going, hold on. I know you're saying that you're the way to heaven. I know you're going to prepare, but how are we going to get? I've, I've been searching on, on Google Maps. I've never found heaven's location. And I got a camel that, that takes me all over the place, and the camel's awesome. But I heard heaven's up there, and I'm down here, and my camel can't fly yet. So I don't know how I'm going to get there. And Jesus answers his question by saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is going to require faith because there's going to be parts of this that you don't have the answers to today. There's going to be clarity that you wish you had that you don't have today. I think of one of the most popular prayers that, that you and I pray when we're trying to follow Jesus, when we're trying to have faith, is we ask for more clarity. Like, is that a prayer that you pray at times? Like, God, could you give me more clarity around? I just, I want more clarity. I remember sitting down with a mentor one time over coffee, and we were just talking about the future, and, and I was trying to make a decision in my career, and, and I asked him, I said, man, I just wish, like, I wish I could, I could know what this is going to mean 10 years. Like, I wish Jesus would tell me where this is going to play out 10 years from now. And my mentor said this. He said, hey, Kevin, if Jesus gives you a 10-year plan, let me know about it because that's not usually how he works. <laughs> that's not usually how he works. He usually will just give us the next step in our journey. I was even thinking about why that is so good for us, too. I was thinking about my journey when I came to Foothills at 20 years old. I wasn't even 21 yet. I knew I wanted to go into ministry. I knew I wanted to rip an electric guitar and say, I'm helping people find and follow Jesus this way. This is going to be awesome. And I remember being in that interview and being so excited. And no, I don't know all the steps, but did you know it was to the month, to the month, that I came here at 20. To that month, 10 years later, my wife Katie and I are sitting in an office with our founding pastor Greg and his wife Liz talking about the plan for him to retire and me to take on the leadership of the church over a three-year plan. It was 10 years to the month from when I started here. You want to know what would have happened if, if when I was 20 and I was in that interview, if God was like, hey, here's what's going to happen if you go to this church. One day, you're going to be the leader of this church. You want to know what I would have done? You would have never met me. <laughs> I would have tucked and I would have run as fast as possible in the other direction. That would have, I would have not been able to handle that yet. I wouldn't have been able to handle that. That's nothing that I was ever going to be ambitious for or wanted. That would have freaked me out. I would have settled to say no. Or, or you know what else could have happened? I could have said, you know, that's exciting. And instead, I could take that information and, and I could, honestly, I could have become an entitled brat along the process because I could have thought, well, I know where this story is gonna end and I might bypass the parts of my journey where God is wanting to build my character, where God is wanting to teach me to trust him when I step out in faith. See, God doesn't give all the details because in all honesty, you're a human who can't handle them yet. Your faith can't handle them yet. And, and by the way, it's not just because you can't handle them yet. See, if God gave you all the answers, guess what you might decide? You might decide that you're in control and that you don't need him anymore. You might walk out of faith altogether in that scenario where you say, you know what? I, now I got the answers. God, thanks for telling me. I will see you later. And I am out. No, faith requires unanswered questions because, again, we're leaning on someone else. We're leaning on the Lord. See, faith, faith and doubt have a strong relationship. Faith is not 
the absence of doubt. If someone has told you that, they've lied. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the means to overcome your doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the means to overcome your doubt. So so in our time left, before we celebrate baptism, I want to look at three ways in this story that the Lord helped Thomas to overcome his doubt with faith. Three ways, because I think there's three ways in this, not only that he did, but I think they can encourage you and be ways that you, in your journey, can overcome doubt so that these doubts don't become a dead end in your faith journey. The first is this, how do I overcome doubt? Stick with other believers. How do I overcome doubt? Stick with other believers. When Jesus first appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. Thomas wasn't in the room. Thomas wasn't there to see what Jesus had done. So he wasn't present with them, and he missed the moment. So when they came and they're saying, we've seen the Lord, it's amazing. Thomas leaned into the skeptic side of him. It's like, I don't believe it. I didn't see it. Thomas wasn't present. But, but, Although we give Thomas the nickname of being a doubter, I want to show you something that took a step of faith, in my opinion, from Thomas before he got to see Jesus. Let's look at the story. John 20, 26, it says, Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. This time Thomas was with them. Thomas showed back up. Thomas was doubting, and there were others who believed. He disagreed with them, but he knew there was something special about this group, and he had been a part of something special in their faith journey up to this point. And so Thomas didn't quit inside of this doubt. Thomas didn't say, you know what? You guys are crazy, and I'm done with this. I'm done with you in the process. Thomas showed back up. Eight days later, he's in the room with them. It says the doors were locked, but suddenly as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Just the exact things that Thomas said. I better see this. Unless I see this, I'm not going to believe. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas says, my Lord, my God. He believed Thomas got to see Jesus. Where? With the other believers. With the other believers. Listen, if you stick with other believers in Jesus long enough, you are going to run into Jesus. If you stick with other believers long enough, even when you are experiencing seasons of doubt, you are going to run into Jesus. This is one of the reasons that church is so essential to your faith. It is so essential to your faith. It is so essential to your faith. In Hebrews, it says, do not neglect meeting together as some do. As some do, some people when they're doubting, they step away to process their doubt on their own. And that is not how this works. Faith in Jesus is not a solo sport, you guys. It's not a solo sport. It's a team sport. It's always been a team sport. We follow Jesus and learn how to follow him within the context of community. Listen to me, church. Church is not a supplement to your faith. It's essential. It is not a supplement to your faith. It is essential. And it's why at this church, at Foothills, as we've grown, as God has blessed us to be able to reach more people, it's why we work on growing smaller as well and doing small groups so that you can spend time in close community, in relationship with other believers. And I believe that small groups, it's an essential part of your faith. My, My wife and I, we're in a busy season we got three kids that are five years old and younger, all right? Five-year-old, almost three-year-old, seven-week-old today, all right? Yeah. I have faith that I will sleep again. <laughs> just... We're busy. We're tired. It's a wild season. Can I tell you something? Small groups is a non-negotiable for us. It's a non-negotiable. Let me say it again. Small groups is a non-negotiable for our family. Why? Because I know me. 
I know I'm human. And I know that outside of the context of being around other believers, my faith is very fragile. And I know my wife. And I know that outside of the context of being in close community with other believers, her faith is fragile. And I just want to say, like, I have seen some really sweet things in this busy season that we're in for my wife and I. Just recently, my wife, you know, she's going through things. As this is our third, our third child, after you have a baby, women have, it's called postpartum feelings. That's all I'm going to say, all right? They go through, and I'm going to tread lightly, all right? <laughs> Treading lightly. I want to be everything I can be for my wife in this season. I want to be. I've never gone through what she's going through. I don't know that experience. But I've walked up at moments where my wife is crying on the couch. I'm like, oh no, okay. And I come up and I can't tell you how many times she said, no, it's happy. It's happy tears. I was struggling today and Kennedy sent me this text. Kennedy's in our small group. Or Kara sent me this text. Or Hannah sent me this text and it's just what I needed today to remember that Jesus is good. That Jesus is good. And I'm like, yes, awesome. I needed the help of the others. <laughs> This is great. Guys, church, being in community, it is not a supplement to your faith. If you are going to overcome doubt, you need to stick with other believers because there's going to be seasons you are going to doubt. If you will stick with other believers, I assure you, you will run into Jesus. There is a reason that Jesus designed the church to be an essential part of your faith. Second thing, Stick with other believers. Trust what you know is true. Second thing, trust what you know is true. See, again, faith has areas that make you feel crazy, things that you can't explain because there's answers that you don't have, but Jesus will give us enough that we can stand on something that we know is true. And in this story with Thomas, what Jesus did is he presented the proof that he rose from the dead. And the proof of the resurrection was going to be all that Thomas needed to trust the rest of the process from then on. He, here's what Jesus says after Thomas calls him Lord. John 20, 29 says, Then Jesus told him, You believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. You believe because you've seen, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. In other words, there's going to be things that you see that are true and you believe. But, but Thomas, belief doesn't always require seeing every detail. There's going to be things that you have to step into that you can't really explain. And what you need to be able to stand on is what you cannot deny is true. That's what the resurrection did for Thomas. And Thomas gets a bad rap. We call him the doubter. Thomas wasn't the doubter. Thomas doubted. In a moment, Thomas actually became the overcomer. Thomas became a man of faith. Thomas got so strengthened by this that, did you know Thomas was the first and only disciple who took the good news of Jesus outside of the Roman Empire? He settled into India where he would evangelize and where eventually he would be martyred for his faith. That's the type of faith that Thomas had, but he had to have this moment where Jesus is saying, look, if you can trust that I'm alive, then I'm going to need you to trust me where you step into areas where you're not, you're not going to have all the answers, Thomas. You're not going to have all the clarity, and can I tell you something? The resurrection is what Thomas could stand on, and the resurrection is what you and I can stand on in our faith as well. There are things in your life there are things in your life you are not going to be able to explain. There are questions that you are going to have. But last week, if you were here on Easter, we talked about the fact that there is an undeniable amount of evidence that proves that the tomb was empty because Jesus rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. And because he conquered that, we can stand on that undeniable truth to have faith, even though there's aspects of our faith that don't have answers yet, that we can't explain. We overcome doubt by standing on what we know is true. And every step that we take to trust what we know is true, guess what it will do? It will strengthen your faith. It will strengthen your faith. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've read something about what it looks like to follow Jesus, that it happens in community. And so I trust, I get in a group, and then I see, that's right, Jesus. You didn't say it because 
because it was a cute idea. You said it because it was best for me. That's right. I now know that's true. Jesus, you told me to give and, and be generous. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step on that, and I'm going to see, oh, wow, now I've seen it. Now I've seen what happens to my life when I choose to trust you in my finances. Now I can't deny that truth. Oh, you tell me to forgive people who hurt me? I don't understand that. That's going to require a step of faith. But I can't deny you rose from the dead. Jesus, I'll try. I'll step on that. I'll forgive. And you will see Jesus show that what he says is what is best over and over again. This is how we overcome our doubts. This is how we overcome our doubts. So we stick with other believers. Trust what you know is true. And third, do the next thing he tells you to do. If you want to overcome doubt in your faith journey, you need to do the next thing that he tells you to do. You need to focus. What is the next thing that he tells me to do? In this story, when he showed up, he told Thomas to reach over and touch the wounds. And, and here's what's interesting. He took Thomas through the exact place that Thomas doubted. Many times, the way that Jesus will strengthen your faith is he will take you directly through the place where you are doubting. He will take you directly through that place so that he can strengthen your faith. This is where he took Thomas, directly to the place he doubted. I want to share my favorite foothill story, my favorite foothill story. If you've, if you've come to our next uh, lunches, which we've got one in two weeks from today after our second service, and if you're looking to find more ways to get connected in our church or learn more, I want to invite you to free lunch. We'll have child care. We would love to have you be a part of that. But if you've been at our next lunch, you've heard this story. Um, uh, here, here are Seneca campus. You've heard this story. But, but for Pendleton and those that maybe haven't heard this story before, uh, I'd love to share it with you. And if you've heard it before, I hope it encourages you all over again. My favorite story at Foothills is, is of a, a young lady that attended. She came through a small group here at this church. It was the first way that she attended our church. She came to a small group, and she was a little bit unsure about Jesus in the process, but she wanted friends, and, and she was at a stage in her life where she was looking to build friends, and so she came, and she built community, and then she started to realize that these people were kind of crazy, that they, they, they loved Jesus, and that they had been transformed by Jesus. And so she got curious about that through the process. She leaned in. She started coming on Sundays. She began serving. And then she realized that Jesus was chasing her. She realized that Jesus was pursuing her. She realized that Jesus was real. She realized that Jesus truly did die for her. And she knew it at a distance, but it was time to make that decision in her heart. And so she trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of her sins. And the next step after you trust Jesus to save you is baptism. Let me tell you something interesting about this young lady. When she was nine years old, she watched her dad get taken to prison. She's not seen her dad since that moment at nine years old. And one of the hardest things for her to overcome in her faith was the fact that Jesus, and all throughout that point on, Jesus would refer to God in heaven as the Father as our father. And that, that title, father, it came with a bunch of baggage. It came with a bunch of doubts. It came with a bunch of pain. It came with a bunch of hurt. And so to think about, man, I, I want to trust Jesus, but the, the idea that, that he's father, how am I going to reconcile this pain in my heart? But she knew, she knew Jesus was real. And the next baptism, it happened to be on a Father's Day at Foothills, a day that would cause her to come to terms with the exact thing that she was struggling with. And we have a picture of her baptism here. Pendleton, it'll cover your whole screen. Um, it's my wife, and uh, she's not cheering. Uh, the water is freezing cold. Um, it's not today. It's not cold today. Um, that's me and Pastor Brian Marshall. This was, this was before we knew we were going to get married one day. This is before we knew what God was doing in our story. And um, Jesus took her right through the place 
that she struggled with doubt the most. And on this day, she took that step of faith and Jesus restored for her the relationship with the title Father. She now has a heavenly Father who healed every wound and is healing every area of question that was created by sin from her earthly father and from the brokenness of this world. And so today, when she prays, when my wife prays, she prays to her father in heaven. She prays to her father in heaven. I don't know where you're doubting today. I don't know where you're doubting today. But I know that you are doubting because you're a human and I'm a human. I know there's areas in your heart where you've got, you, you kind of feel crazy. You kind of feel like there's questions that you wish could be answered. I don't know if it's about a relationship. I don't know if it's about a loved one that seems far off and you're doubting if God's capable of bringing them back. I don't know if there's something that's been broken and you're not sure if God can heal it. I don't know if there's an illness that you're walking through and you're doubting if God even cares or sees you in that situation. I don't know what it is where you are doubting, but here's what I know is that there's a savior in heaven, Jesus, and he loves you enough to come down here and die for you to let you know that he wants to walk you through that doubt to a place where he can save you and heal you and change you from that doubt today. And so I want to pray over and into that doubt in just a moment. Can I ask all of our campuses, will we stand up right now? Can we stand? Can we stand? I want to pray over your area of doubt, but I also want to encourage you, what is that next step Jesus is calling you to take? What is that next step that he's calling you to take? For some of you, for some of you, today, the step is to get baptized. That's the next step. If you've trusted in Jesus, the next step is to go public and say, you know what? I'm telling everyone. And you may have doubts today about that decision. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, your faith won't strengthen unless you take that step through that doubt to take that step of faith. We're, we're going to worship in a moment. Bands are coming out at all campuses. We're going to worship in a moment. And, and as we worship, you're going to have an opportunity to head out to our concourses at all the campuses. We've got teams ready. We've got, we've got changes of clothes ready. We've got towels ready. We've got everything you need to step through that doubt into that step of faith today. But first, I'm going to pray. And before I do that, let me kick it to Pastor Joseph. Can we show our, our Pendleton campus love? Church, church, let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. Jesus, you are amazing. You are amazing. We thank you that we can have confidence in your love for us because you came here and died for us. And so we know, we know that you build our faith through us having to experience doubt through us having to experience the limitations of just being a human. And I pray that the enemy would not use those seeds of doubt to cause us to quit or to run away, but that today we would see that doubt as a place where we can lean in with faith to overcome that doubt and see how good you are. So God, you know the area of doubt that every single person in this room is experiencing. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak peace. When you showed up in that upper room, when Thomas was there, your first words were, peace be with you. Peace be with you. I pray your peace over this room right now. I pray, I pray your peace over hearts right now. I pray your peace over the steps of faith that need to happen. I pray your peace over those that need to step forward and go public with their faith in Jesus through baptism today. I pray your peace. And listen, if you are in the room right now and you have never received Jesus as your savior, if you've never confessed him as Lord of your life, you cannot experience this peace. There is no path to peace without Jesus Christ. But you can experience it right now. And so if you want to receive Jesus right now, I want to invite you to pray a prayer like this. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I do have doubts. I do have questions. But I feel you calling me right now. And I believe that you came here and died for me. I believe you rose from the dead. And so I'm stepping through my doubts right now, and I'm asking Jesus, would you save me? Would you save me in this moment? I'm going to commit to follow you from this moment forward. And listen, if you prayed that prayer right now, you need to know it's done. It is finished. If you brought your heart to that prayer right now, it is done. You are saved. 
Peace be with you in this moment. Peace be with you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. It's in your amazing name we pray. Amen.